Good morning, New Life CNY. It is wonderful to be here this morning to gather together with you in your homes. We're so grateful that we are able to still meet even though we are apart. God is good, is he not? Let us today open up with a time of prayer before we begin worshiping our Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have given us all the resources we need to be able to still gather together to be able to have a worship time, to be able to hear your word, and to be able to be refreshed for the week to come. We ask that as the service moves, that you move with us. Lead us where you want us to go. We ask this in your name, amen. I raise a hallelujah. In the presence of my enemies, I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
that his love can reach. There's no place that we can find peace. There's no end to amazing grace.
We need a little We need a little Miracles happen when you move in this coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move in this coming. Miracles happen when you move in this coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. This is the move. This is the move. This is the move. We need a move. Heavenly Father, you are moving. You are moving throughout this country. You are taking this time that we have had at home and you are using it for your good. You are using it to talk to people. You are using it so that they can have those distractions removed. And we are so thankful. We pray that as people are listening, that they are not letting it go in one ear and out the other, but go into their hearts, Lord. That they are able to be changed. That we are able to be changed. That we are then able to be your light and continue with this move. Continue with this move that is going to change this world, Lord. It's no longer for Satan to take control. It is your battle and you are going to win it, Lord. We're so grateful for today. We ask that as Pastor Chris comes up, that it is your words he is speaking. That you are taking him where you need him to go. We ask this in your name. Amen. Right now, Pastor Bill is online. He's there. Um, and you're able to talk to him. You're able to listen to the service, ask questions. And we also have links posted. You'll see that there is a link there where you can access the sermon slides and where you can take notes, download it. So please access that. We also have our different ways to be able to give posted. They're through Easy Type and it is easy. Both links are there provided for you. And finally, those prayer requests. Your hearts are full and let us pray with you. Let us take some of those and have a team of people praying for you. We are praying for you every day, and we just want to know how we can pray for you specifically. You can send those either through Facebook, through the chat if you feel comfortable, or send them through email at prayerrequest at newlifecny.org. We look forward to hearing those and praying for you. This week we do have a surprise slide for you. We tried it a couple weeks ago, but we were having some issues with Wi-Fi. So today during Pastor Chris's message, there is a surprise slide. If you are one of the first to comment on that, then we will have a small gift card coming your way. So be on the lookout and post what that surprise slide is. Right now we're going to have the bumper video come up. That way you can have a moment to be able to access those sermon notes and to also be able to send your prayer request.
Good morning, everyone. Nice to be able to kind of see you this morning. Uh, welcome, everybody, to New Life CNY, our Sunday morning gathering. A number of years ago, when I was in seminary, I commuted with a friend of mine. He was a really big hunter, and <clears throat> I was a real big fisherman. He didn't like fishing, and I've never really been hunting. I'm not the kind of guy you want to have a gun in his hand. So we would go to commute to seminary together, and we would talk, and he said, man, I had the weirdest weekend. <clears throat> he said it was duck season, and he and his, his uh, teenage son, I guess it was like a, a weekend when um, the young kids could go uh, hunting with their dads and things like that. And he said, we're... You know, it's my, my folks have this pond on their property, and there's duck blinds. And he says, and I'm in one duck blind, and, and he's in another. And he said, <clears throat> there are ducks flying over his head all morning. So finally, he says, here we are, we're all camoed up. He goes, I got a shotgun, and I'm trying to get his attention. Now, this is before texting and things like that. Uh, so he says, I'm starting to, like, wave to him you know, like point up in the air saying, these things are just flying over your head Will you shoot one. And he's pointing up and of course his son replies by waving back to him. And he says, so I'm doing this for like five or ten minutes, trying to get his attention to say like, look up. And he's waving to me like real, like hi, hi, hi. So finally he says, above you. And the son responds back to him, I love you too, dad. And he just kind of put his hands up and, and a few minutes after that, they blew their cover and they went home. So he, his wife's waiting for him, you know, father, son, go out hunting together. And he comes back, he's like, I don't know what's wrong with my son. He can't take directions and we didn't get kill any ducks. And, and, and the son comes in and, he, and she says, how was hunting? And he says, well, we didn't kill any ducks, but, but, God, but dad yelled out across the pond that he loved me. It was a good day. And so it's interesting that a spoken word from a dad to a child can turn a bad hunting trip into a good one. And this morning, we're going to talk about this idea of the power of the spoken word. And we're continuing in our series in the book of James, where he talks about this very idea. And I'm going to read a passage to you. It says, James chapter 3, 1 through 12. Okay, long passage, so hold on. Okay, so not many of you should become teachers my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so large and are driven by such a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set amongst uh, our members, staining the whole body setting on fire the entire course of life. It's set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creatures, can be tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the fullness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, this ought not be so. So first thing we want to look at this idea is this idea of words and their power. Now, one thing in a society like we live in, in you know, 21st century America, we have freedom of speech. We have freedom of expression. And with the, you know, outburst or the outburst or the inception of the internet, we're able to do that on a huge scale. It's kind of like, you know, we all have a voice these days. But what we need to understand is that there is a very serious uh, power that comes in the idea of the way we speak. And what what God is reminding us here is that it's very powerful and that we shouldn't just rush in to this idea of expressing ourselves and teaching without taking that into account. 
What happens when you're someone like me who speaks for a living, that's, that's, that's what I do, it's what I'm doing right now. So, I mean, it, what, what, what happens is we very often become too familiar with it. And with familiarity often comes contempt. Now, I remember um, I, I was uh, one of my first few jobs I ever had was working in a commercial bakery with my buddy Tom Pepe. Hey, 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 shout out to you, Tom Pepe. Anyway, and we got this job together, and we, we made apple pies and fruit pies and things like that. And we had this machine that we would go, and we'd get dough, and they would punch it into this proper size, and you'd put it through this little kind of square roller thing that would roll it out, and then you'd put it into this kind of compression roller that would turn it into a perfect pie crust. And then someone would be on the other end and they'd be putting them in. And we would make hundreds of pies at a time. So you're doing all this work and everything like that. And it would happen at least a few times a shift. You get lazy, you get tired, you know, you're, you know, I was probably 17 years old or something like that. I'd probably been out or something like that the night before and hanging around and not getting enough sleep. That you'd push that dough in and all of a sudden you'd feel that roller just kind of grab your finger and go, wait a minute here, you know, if that went a little bit further, I'd probably get my arm sucked into this piece of machinery, and this was in the 80s, they didn't have much safety device, I think the safety device was an axe where you just kind of hack the limb off or something like that, but, you know, here it was, and you'd sit back and you go, whoa, that got kind of close there, and what would happen is, here you are working with this dangerous piece of equipment, but because you become so familiar with it, because you become kind of laissez-faire with it, you could do some damage. And that happens to us with this idea of the way we speak. We speak and we go out online, we give our opinions, we do all these things, we go on the book of faces and we go crazy, all this stuff. And we need to understand that God is pulling us up short and saying, listen, there's power in what you're doing. And take it seriously. And if you're called to teach, if you're called to mentor, if you're called to disciple, understand Check yourself. Don't get familiar, too familiar with it, because you can become contemptible of it. And when that would happen to me in that bakery, what I would do is I would pull back and say, you know what, maybe I need to just take, you know, uh, take a break. Maybe I just need to sit down for a minute, you know, and have a cup of coffee or, or something like that. And, you know, I think in this day and age we live in, this is one of the pressures, I think, that are put on young people today. Everything they do not everything, but most, they're recorded. They're constantly being observed, whether it's by overbearing parents or whether it's by somebody with a, with a camera phone. I mean, when I was a kid, there were only two types of people who normally were recorded. The famous and the infamous. I can remember as a young boy in school seeing pictures and hearing or having it read to me um, what Nikita Khrushchev said in 1960 um, at the UN about uh, American, American imperialism. And how it frightened me. How it frightened a generation where we got locked into this Cold War. And I can remember watching the Olympics saying, as long as we beat those Russians in events, we're better. And I can remember that day and that happened because men, men began to challenge themselves and verbally attack one another. I can also remember being in school listening to the April 4th speech by Bobby Kennedy uh, when he announced that Martin Luther King uh, Jr. had died. If you've never heard that speech, it's uh, besides the Gettysburg Address, it's, they say it's one of the most powerful speeches ever spoken on American soil. It is an incredible, incredible spoken word. And when I was young, you had either the infamous or the famous being quoted. Now everybody is. And what a pressure it is to be a young person today. I kid around and say to my friends that if we had the video capability when I was young, I'd be unemployable right now. That's a pressure that, 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 that's on them. And what I think God is saying is just take into account, be circumspect about what you say, about what you put out there, because nowadays it's there for all posterity. It's never going away. I, mean, I deleted pictures from 2013, and for some reason they pop back up on my computer, on my phone. I don't know how that works, but that is just a pressure that our people, our young people have on them today, and I think, boy, that's, that's, that's a lot of responsibility. And we need to remember that there is a lot of power in what we say, and what we communicate. So this is kind of a wake-up call that God's giving us is just to be careful. Just to be careful. 
So we need to see the power of the words, and then we need to see the effect, or words in their effect, how they affect us. And he, he talks about that here in, in this idea that, you know, there's a huge amount of life and death are in the power of the tongue. Blessing and cursing are in the power of um, of the tongue, and we need to be careful, and we we need to uh, be be reminded of that. We need to take into account that these things are not just air. Now, there used to be a ministry out that that took place in the early uh, mid '90s called Promise Keepers. It was a men's thing. They were trying to get uh, men to return back to God and, and back to church, and they gave an illustration, and it was really interesting. And it was in the Colorado. Uh, University of Colorado football stadium. And I remember listening to this. It was like on a Saturday. I think I listened to it live. And the, the speaker said, listen, what I want you to do is I want each and every one of you to take a hair off of your head. And, you know, for some people like me, they said you can borrow one from the person next to you, PDB. And he said, all right, now take the hair and I'll hold it up over your head. Everybody be quiet. On the count of three, we're going to drop the hair. And he, one, two, three, and they dropped the hair. And you didn't hear everything. And then he says, now what I want you to do is everybody here, take off your right shoe. And I'm like, I was talking with Amy, and I'm like, there's like 70,000 people there. This guy's getting 70,000 people to take off their right shoe. He said, now everybody, take off your right shoe. And he said, now hold it up over your head. Sorry, some were going to smell. You know, I didn't play it up. It was really funny. And I'm like, this guy has now a stadium of 70,000 men with their shoe up over their head. And he said, I want to count to three, and I want you to drop that shoe. He said, one, two, three. You should have heard it. It sounded like applause. It was like, clock, 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 clock. all these shoes hitting the floor. And it's not a huge boom. And he was talking about the idea that many of the things we think that we're doing are like we're dropping a hair on somebody, but what we're really doing is dropping a shoe on them. And when it comes down to our words, most of us, if you're like me, you think your words are just like a hair. But in reality to the receiver, it's like getting hit with a shoe. By the way, what did Khrushchev wing over his head? It was a shoe. We need to be, understand that our words have effect. We think we're just throwing hairs out there. What we're really doing is throwing shoes. Sometimes we're throwing rocks. Sometimes we're throwing daggers. You know one thing you can't do? You can't unring a bell. We need to understand the effect that words have on people. And what words have an effect on us, the sayer? I mean, words are just the summation of what is in our hearts. Jesus says in the Gospels that out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So our words, they, they, when they come out, what they are showing, uh, what they are doing is they are a revealer or they are a window to our heart. Most of prayer is us to hear our own heart and reflect back and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, I didn't know that was there. So we need to understand that these words have power, have tremendous effect. Then let's look at this idea of words and their healing. Now, words, as we talked about, are, are a mirror, or they are an expression of our heart. And when we look and we see at our heart, we look and hear our words, and we see that our heart is damaged, or it's full of things it shouldn't be. What we need to understand that Christianity is not a religion of renovation. It is a religion, or it's a faith of total restoration. To the point where Jesus doesn't say, you need to have your heart fixed, or you need to have your life fixed. What Jesus says is, no, you need to go through a born-again experience. You need to reboot your being. It's not about renovation. It's about a total restoration. And the way that we get our words fixed is that the next one the blanks is that we need a new heart and a new fuel. 
Christianity is not about getting yourself cleaned up. It's not about just getting yourself fixed up a little bit. It is about restoring the center of your being. Now in the 80s I was looking at a truck because young guys who liked to fish had trucks. So I was out there looking at a truck and I remember there was this Ford F-250. It was really cool. It had big tires and a roll bar and those big lights and things like that. And I'm like, boy, I'd look really good in that truck. And I remember I made an appointment. I walked over, you know, went up to see this guy's truck. And there was this big white tank under the back uh, bumper. And I was like, it looks cool, but what is it? So he told me, he says, well, this truck's from Canada. And I was like, oh, I didn't know they made trucks in Canada. He said, well, no, they make it in Detroit, but it was from Canada. And it runs on propane. And I'm like, this is like 1985. I'm like, really? So we opened up the hood. And where there would have been a carburetor was this, like, it looked like a really weird supercharger or something. And he says, yeah, this device is there and what causes this thing to run on propane. I'm like, where do you get propane? What do I go to, like, get my gas grill filled up in my truck? I don't, where do I, where do I go get propane? He's like, no, but you can go to this place. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot of work. And it, when I'm saying it breaks, he's like, yeah, that piece right there is an expensive piece. And you can't run it on gas. you got to run it on propane. It's not like you could do both. And I'm like, wow, so if I have a problem with that, I really got to put a new motor in it that runs on gas or go to Canada and get this thing that runs on propane. He's like, yeah. In Christianity, what it does, as the prophets say, it gives us a new heart. And because it's a new heart, it runs on a different fuel. You can't run a propane vehicle on gas, and you can't run a gas vehicle on propane. Why? Because the engine is totally different. The engine's different. And when we become a Christian, what happens is we get a new heart, and we need to understand that that new heart runs on a different kind of fuel than we're used to as humans. There's these YouTubers out there, they buy these crummy cars, and what they do is they run them on crazy stuff. I watched them run a Ford Taurus on bleach. And it, it is the wildest thing. They'll be like, we got seven gallons of bleach, which is like, you know, $30, and they're putting it in there and putting it in there, and they start the car up, and it's, and it's running, and it's like, haka, 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 and it's blowing, it's billowing out smoke, out white smoke out of the back, and they'll drive the thing around until it dies. They'll check the oil, and then they'll be like, tomorrow we're going to run a, we're going to run a, um, we're going to run a, you know, a Chevy Malibu on mayonnaise and mustard. I mean, and, and then they make this concoction and they pour it in there, and it's blowing out mustard. You know, it's just the craziest thing every day, but for some reason I watch it. And it's wild. They're like, we, can, we, we ran a car for three days on bleach. And it's like, yeah, but it ran terrible, and you maxed out at like 40 miles an hour, and plus everybody who walked by you, their clothes turned white. I mean, it was like, it, 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 it ran, but it didn't run well, because it's not designed to run on that. It's designed to run on gasoline. And when we become Christians, we get a new motor, we get a new heart. And it's not designed to run on what we used to run on. Now there are churches, I belong to an organization that ran on pride, cult of personality, arrogance, and fear. And there are churches that run that way. But that's not the way our new heart is supposed to run. It's supposed to be running on love, joy, peace, forgiveness, discipline. It's, that's the way it's supposed to run. And in order for us to have our hearts healed, we need to not have it fixed. We need to have it transformed. We need a new heart. And in order to make that run right, we need to run it on what it's designed to run on. Fruit of the Spirit. That's why the gospel is so important to us. The gospel reminds us that our faith isn't built upon what we do. It's based on what God did for us. And the gospel reminds us that this God who we've been so afraid of who we thought has hated us forever, 
gospel reminds us that he loves us and he'll do anything for us. And in order for us to have our tongues healed, we need our hearts transformed. And we need to begin to run on the fuel that it's designed to run on. So what we need is the gospel to become real to us when we understand that this God who runs everything, he loves us. And then what we need that God to do is to remind us of all the humiliation, all the pain, all the hurt, all that he went through at the cross. We need that God to say to us, I did this for you. Our God's not a God who loves us from, uh, from in the cosmos. Our God is a who loves us enough to put on a crummy pair of sandals and go to a cross for us. Our God is not just a philosopher. Our God is not just a teacher. He was actually a human being. And he died for us so we could have this rotten motor, this rotten heart inside of us changed. And that we can run on the fields designed of love, joy, peace. So don't just look at the words that come out of your mouth. Look at the motor that produces them, your heart. And let the gospel, the realization of what God did for us, change the very center of your being. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. No faith in the world remotely comes close to the Christian faith. It just it can't even come close. The gospel is just mind-boggling. And Lord, as we are here today, so many people are like myself. We say things that we wish we could unsay. We've rung so many bells we wish we could unring. Lord, let us not just externally try to conform our life, but let us understand that internally we need a new heart. And in order to maintain that heart, we need to let it run on what you designed it to run on. So help us, Lord, today enter into the realization of what you need to do in our lives. But Lord, also bring us into the remembrance of the gospel. That we serve God who loves us and did all of that for us. Let each and every one of us this week hear the word, I did this for you. And let that change our very being. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Just...
right now Pastor Bill is on Zoom. He is there for you to be able to come, talk with him, talk with one another. We hope you have a wonderful week, and God bless.